When thinking about evolution by natural selection, most of us tend to picture incremental changes to specific features of an organism that continually improve its function. The classic example that almost every student first comes across is Darwin's finches. The story goes roughly like this. While traveling the Galapagos aboard HMS Beagle, Charles Darwin studied the characteristics of the different finches he encountered across the islands. He noticed that the shapes and sizes of the beaks changed continuously with the particular circumstances of each environment. Evolution had adapted them to the different food sources available. Put simply, a pre-existing feature of the birds, i.e. the beak, was refined for each island. This is a great way to start to understand evolution, but if we're not careful, it can limit our thinking about evolution as just tweaking already existing structures. Instead, we need to ask where do complex structures come from in the first place? It's here we find the truly transformative power of natural selection, the power to create whole new functions, organisms, or ways of life. A key part of this lies in what the biologist Neil Shubin has called revolutionary repurposing. In this video, I want to show you how these ideas inspired me while programming my cellular evolution simulation. In my last video, I introduced a simulation that I've been making in which these cell-like entities swim around the little environment and gather resources to survive and reproduce. But over the past months, I've been making many changes and improvements. To briefly recap, these protozoa cells extract mass and energy from plants or dead cells and use them to synthesize complex molecules which are in turn used to construct functions for the cells. Cells were produced by splitting into new child cells and passing on copies of their genes with the chance of random mutation. This rough picture is still the same in the new version of the simulation but the construction system has become much more complicated and, crucially, it's now tied to the gene system in a much more interesting way. So, if you need a more detailed recap, you can still go back to the original video and find those details. But before we get into all these exciting new changes, let's back up a bit and talk about how most computer simulations of evolution work, including the old version. If you've seen a few evolution simulations, then there's a good chance that they were using some version of what's called a genetic algorithm. The rough idea of applying evolution to developing complex systems within computers dates back to at least Alan Turing, who even discussed the idea in his famous paper where he introduced the imitation game, or as we now know it, Turing test. But it was another computer scientist working around 30 years later called John Holland who really refined these ideas into what we now know as genetic algorithms. The basic idea starts with the fundamental principles of natural selection in biology, namely reproduction, variation, and selection. But a critical part of genetic algorithms is how a simulated organism is separated into a genetic representation and a so-called phenotypic representation in the computer. Like in real biology, the genetic representation is a kind of recipe for how to construct the simulated organism. So if we go back to the example of Darwin's finches, the beaks of the birds are what biologists would call phenotypic traits of the organism. These traits are coded for by the bird's genes, but ultimately it's the beak and the environment, not the genes directly, that decide whether or not the bird reproduces or dies. So concretely, a genetic algorithm for this example might look something like this. We have a couple of genes represented by some fractional numbers in the computer between 0 and 1. One number controls the length of the beak by interpolating between some minimum and maximum. The other does the same for the beak size. The numbers would then be used to construct and simulate the beak and control whether or not food is acquired, and therefore whether or not the organism survives. If it does survive and reproduce, the genes will be passed on, but with the chance to randomly change. And this is how the simulation worked, basically. There were many genes represented by single numbers, each corresponding to different data structures or traits in the cell. For example, there would have been a growth rate gene that modulates how quickly the cell tries to increase its size during its lifetime. Overall, this setup tends to work pretty nicely across a wide variety of simulations, many of the kinds of simulations that you might have seen elsewhere. If things are set up correctly, the process of evolution will optimize the genes to produce fitter and fitter populations. But there are problems that I've so far glossed over, and they lie in an oversimplification that I made a few moments ago when I was talking about how genes code for traits. We all intuitively know that this is not exactly the case. Sure, we know that genes play a role in determining traits like a person's height or weight, but diet and environment are also important factors, 
Biologists understand that traits are not just direct translations of dreams, but the result of gene-environment interactions. Traits aren't the result of just nature or nurture, as the saying goes, but nature via nurture. So, what does any of this imply for computer simulations? At first blush, it may seem like an unimportant detail. Variation in the environment means that the relationship between genes and traits is noisy. You don't always get the same height for the same genes. But arguably, this is just making evolution more difficult. If a gene can be passed to a descendant that will reliably result in a trait, then it surely makes it easier to distinguish between good and bad genes and evolution can progress faster. However, only viewing the environment as a source of noise is not the right way to think about this. We must move away from thinking about the environment as static, and therefore only permitting one best trait. Instead, we should think about it as dynamic and non-homogeneous. So disruptions to the developmental process between genes and traits aren't noise, they're signals that provide important information about context. Information that can be used to adapt the traits to the specific situation that the organism finds itself in. Neil Shubin gives a great example of this in his book. He recounts the story of the French herpetologist Auguste de Meril, who in 1864 came into possession of some strange and unfamiliar axolotl-like creatures from Mexico. Eventually, the creatures produced eggs, which led to offspring, but these children didn't grow up to resemble their parents at all. Instead, they grew up to resemble familiar and typical members of a known species of salamander. As it turns out, the different environmental contexts of Mexico and a laboratory in France induced dramatically different developmental pathways. These observations, and others like it, gradually developed themselves into a new perspective on evolution called evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO as it's more fondly known. So it seems that environmental context mediating genetic information can have some pretty cool effects. But I think the importance is even more prevalent than this exotic example illustrates. And to see this, we need to zoom right into the organisms themselves. Down to the cellular level, back to where the direct relationship with the simulation lies. The observation is simple. Each cell in your body has exactly the same genes. Yet, they do not have the same traits. Some cells specialize to be neurons or light-sensitive retina cells, or muscle cells, or liver cells, or so on. They do this by using signals from the environment and from each other to regulate the flow of genetic information. And thus, this is what biologists call gene regulation. Now with an understanding of gene regulation and its importance for multicellularity, we can talk about how I went about implementing some of these ideas in the simulation. Let's start with the structure and development of a cell in the newest version. When a cell is born, it always appears featureless, but as it grows, different functional components emerge on the surface of the cell. As you may have guessed, which components grow is determined by a gene regulatory system, meaning that both the genetic and external influences can be at play. But before moving on to how gene regulation is implemented, let's look more closely at these functional components themselves. This purple cell has just been born and is starting to develop. We can see that after a few seconds from its birth, it develops this translucent membrane around its surface. This indicates that an adhesion receptor has formed and the cell is ready to form a binding with another cell. However, despite a couple of its siblings being close by, at first the cell floats alone amongst these larger cells. As it hangs out in the vicinity of this ring of plant cells absorbing nutrients by osmosis, we can see two small feeding receptors start to form on its surface. These are depicted with these circular hooks. There are two forms of feeding available to the protozoa. Though inspired by real biology, the first is osmotrophy, where resources enter the cell through osmosis from the environment, as we've just seen. The available resources in the environment are visualized by these red and green glows and they're deposited into the environment by the plant and the meat cells. The second form of feeding is phagocytosis, where a cell engulfs another and directly extracts resources from it. In the simulation, if a protozoa cell has a plant phagocytosis receptor, um, that's one of those functional components, it can engulf plant cells. And similarly, a meat phagocytosis receptor will allow it to engulf the meat cells. Um, and there's a restriction where a single protozoa cannot have uh, both types of receptors. Uh, this means that there's a chance for cells to specialize in one source of consumption, which is sort of added as a way to encourage multicellularity, because you could have two cells, 
one specialized in uh, as absorbing nutrients from plants and one for meat. But moving on to the full set of possible cell functional components, at the time of recording there are six types. There's the flagella, the spikes, the photoreceptors, then the two kinds of phagocytosis receptors that we just talked about, and finally the adhesion receptors, which we saw as those translucent uh, membranes. So the flagella will provide mobility, the spikes can damage other cells, the photoreceptors can be used to gather light information from the environment, uh, and as discussed, phagocytosis nodes improve the feeding, and finally, the adhesion receptors are somewhat the most important. Uh, they allow the cells to bind together into these multicellular systems. Okay, so we've outlined the possible functional components that a cell can develop, but this raises a couple questions. What determines which functions will grow? How are those functions controlled? For example, if it had a flagella, how would it decide to generate thrust? Um, and alternatively, if the functional component is a source of information, like the photoreceptors, how does that information get used to make decisions? So, the most critical part of the simulation that implements all this is what I've called the surface node system. The idea is that a cell is born with a set number of nodes on its surface. These serve as sites for possible functions to grow. These nodes add, act as input-output channels with fixed specifications but flexible behaviour. Think of this like wiring for a USB port on your computer. The USB port is fixed, but you could plug in a keyboard or a mouse or a graphics tablet all into the same socket. And the same wiring would be repurposed within the computer to accomplish different things. So similarly in the simulation, each surface node has three numbers associated with it. Firstly, there's the construction signature. Now, this is a number between zero and one, which is given to the node from the cell and it determines which functional component we will attempt to build at this location. Secondly, there are the input and output signals. These are two numbers, one that's passed to the component, if it exists, and another that's sent back from the component to the cell. So this is kind of the input-output interaction between the cell and the component. So if the component were flagellum, the cell could send a number to the flagellum, which the flagellum would then use to decide how much thrust to generate. If the component were instead a spike, the same number would be used to interpret how much the, the spike extends. So now we're looking at a cell that's just been born. You can see actually it's just uh, come from a mother cell that's split into three sort of very similar looking cells at the beginning here. And I'm going to turn on the, um, the G regulatory network in the middle. And we can see that there are no surface nodes on the side yet. Now, the G regulatory network does have... Uh, sort of existing ports that could be used uh, when these when these cells emerge. But for the time being, in this diagram, we don't see any. So we just see all the internal nodes at the moment. What we're going to do is we're just going to watch this cell as it as it sort of goes. Um, and we've seen the first um, cell on the side pop up. Another one's just popped up down here. We can see we've got a phagocytosis node that's starting to grow. We've got a flagella node over here, which is starting to grow. Uh, here, this is a spike. And we can see uh, that what was determined to grow is again um, given by the signature. And the signature here is just connected to this bias. So it's just kind of constant, meaning that um, you can actually see all of these, all of these particular things, they're just uh, connected to this node. This node is always one. So whatever the weight of the connection between the signature and the bias is, is going to determine which, uh, which thing grows here. Um, but this, these signature nodes, they can be connected to anything. So ultimately, they could be um, connected to something more dynamic, something that's changing over time, which, which means that the, the development pattern can change according to these sort of signals from the environment. Okay, so we're back in the UI now, and we're looking at this uh, three-cell organism that has formed in the simulation. So um, we have this cell on the left, um, and these two cells from the right, they, uh, the cell on the left looks like it's from one um, sort of uh, species and the other two look like they're related. If we go into the UI, we can turn on the gene regulatory network and uh, show that here. So now that we can see, uh, see the gene regulatory network of each cell overlaid on top of uh, the cell. Um, and this is the same sorts of thing we've seen before. Um, now, the thing that we're looking at here in particular is the 
intercell connections. So, uh, so as we sort of said before, um, these diamond shapes and these square shapes, these are the input and output um, nodes. And you can see they connect to one another on, along these adhesion connections. So if we look here, we can see um, this node here is an outgoing signal from the cell. And it's connected to various internal nodes of this gray cell. So for example, it's connected here. Um, uh, this is a input to the cell, which is just sort of telling it um, whether or not it has any meat uh, food inside it to digest. Um, and you can see this is being uh, sent along this connection to the outgoing signal. Now, th these cells are, they, they haven't evolved, so we're not going to, um, they've, they've only been uh, in this simulation for a little while, so I doubt there's any interesting mechanisms to especially look at here, but we can sort of get the point of how these things work. So um, uh, these are all kind of random connections at the moment. Uh, but if we look here, we see this is an outgoing signal of 0.59. Now, if we come over here to the binding incoming signal on the blue cell, we see that it's also 0.59. And then that information is getting passed along. So it's going over here to the thrust. Uh, so the cilia thrust, that's the thrust that the cell generates um, without the need for uh, the flagella. So the cells can move around generally in the environment. Uh, the, th the flagella over here, this is providing extra, thr extra thrust along the axis of the flagella. But if the cell just wants to move around, um, it can do so with this sort of less uh, powerful thrust mechanism. All right, so with that, I'm gonna close out this video. I think it's already been quite a lot of information to digest. If you found this interesting and would like to learn more, I wrote a paper that was published last year in the Proceedings of the International Conference on Artificial Life, and you can find a link to that in the description. In the paper, I dive into more detail on the various systems within the simulation, notably how the gene regulatory network chooses which functional components to grow on a surface node. There's a whole process that I developed called a fuzzy lock and key mechanism that loosely draws on some real biochemical phenomena. So if that interests you, go check it out. The code is also available to poke through on GitHub, as well as inst installation instructions on running the program. Although there have been a lot of optimizations since the last version, it still requires a pretty powerful computer to run. Lastly, there's the Discord server for the project. If you'd like to contribute to the project, share any observations, or just suggest ideas, then please join. I've been very busy with work outside the project, but it's been great to interact with people, and I definitely have some people to thank in the Discord community for helping me develop, optimize, and test the simulation. So finally, thank you all for watching.